Welcome to Never Buy the Book Podcast. I'm Kelly Scholes. At 24, I was dead broke and a full-blown alcoholic. By age 40, I was completely out of debt and financially free. Now I share my secrets of success and transformation to audiences around the world as an author, speaker, success mentor, and of course, your podcast host. Each Never Buy the Book podcast features a guest who has overcome obstacles to build an incredible life of fulfillment. Today's guest is what I'd call a dynamic duo, or perhaps, as they are better known, the subline guys, Joseph Bennett and Eli Hans. I made the acquaintance of Joseph and Eli recently and discovered we have much in common, starting with the views on money, passion to keep things simple, and overcoming obstacles. Our discussion will be split into two parts, starting with power of pause and ability to say no when it comes to spending habits. We'll unpack Joseph's book, The Art of Doing Less. Part two, we'll hear about Eli's amazing story of dealing with a life-threatening illness and other challenges musically and artfully told in his stage production, Out of the Blue. Welcome, Joseph and Eli. Oh, it's so great to be here. Thank you so much, Kelly. You bet. Who wants to tell the story about how you guys met? Um, I'll start and then Eli jump in. This is Joseph speaking for those who are just listening and not watching. It was the year 2000 in San Diego, California, and gay pride was happening. And I knew that on Sunday morning, there was going to be a mass commitment ceremony. So Kelly, this was before gay marriage had even become part of the vernacular. It was just a ceremony for couples who knew each other and loved each other and wanted to have a public commitment as so many straight couples had been afforded for centuries. And so I went to witness it. And I had heard about it, uh, of course, because it was a big deal. There were 100,000 people there. And I thought, oh, wouldn't it be nice to actually see, you know, gay people committing to each other. So I had planned to go. And that morning, something much more pressing came up. I had a lot of housework. I, needed to do. <laughs> I, I stayed home and I thought, ah, you know, I'm not going to do it. But I heard this voice that was just pounding in my head that said, go, go. You've got to go. Hurry, go, go. Mm. I was like, no, I don't want to. I got to do my laundry. <laughs> no, go. Get on your bike and go. <laughs> All right. Geez. So I got on my bike and I rode a few miles. <laughs> And I got there and, you know, everything looked totally normal, you know, and uh, I, I got uh, under the shade of a tree and there's this handsome man standing there. I noticed him. And then the ceremony started right at that moment. And 30 seconds after the ceremony started, the minister said to everyone, hey, please face your partner and repeat these vows after me. And I turned to the guy standing next to me. <laughs> and tapped him on the shoulder and i'm a really eloquent speaker you'll, you'll come to realize that listener and i said hey you want to do this wanna w-a-n-n-a hey you want to do this and i and said yes which was totally unlike me because in those days i did nothing without reading consumer reports yeah <laughs> and Boom, we started kind of shyly mumbling the vows under our breath until the minister says uh what his last vow, which was, I promise to support you to your highest potential. And I said to this stranger, make sure you say that one out loud and mean it. Because I love that vow. It's so beautiful. I promise to support you to your highest potential. So we said it together. I promise to support, to support you, you to your, to your highest, highest potential. potential. And at that moment, I just knew it felt like, wow, like this thing just hit me mm -hmm. over the head. And I thought... That's why the voice was screaming, mm. screaming in my head. It's like I was going to be late to my own wedding. <laughs> so we you, we continued it. And he said, no, you know, and I pronounce you committed life partners. And we may kiss each other. And we gave each other a little peck. And I said, now that we're married, what's your name? <laughs> <laughs> and and that, that was 22 and a 20. half years ago. And um, we actually, after you, you've already introduced that Eli had cancer yeah. and thrived through that. Uh, but after he was given the all clear, we went back to the same tree in Balboa Park with our family and friends and got married again. 
Um, this time it was legal. Because officially, was, this time. <laughs> yeah, officially. Yeah, this was in 2015. We got married under the same tree where we met. And, you know, from the very start, it's been a very powerful uh, partnership. Mm -hmm. We've been committed right from the beginning. It's been loving and kind and respectful. We work together. We've been working together from the very start. We had an interior design business. And uh, I guess we'll tell you the story of how things evolved. And yeah. now we're we're doing uh, we're leading you know personal growth workshops together and doing all kinds of things together. And uh, it's been magical. So we are I very grateful. I think a key word that you said there, Eli, was partnership. Because so many people don't think about that, whether it's husband and wife, husband and husband, wife and wife, whatever. It needs to be a partnership. And mm -hmm. they don't think about that. And, you know, when it comes to dealing with finances, which I, I talk about a lot, and, and you guys have been through all of that, and we'll talk more about that, or dealing with any sort of obstacle in your life, if you don't have a partnership to get through it and work together, it makes it that much tougher. And the commitment that you guys made to your highest potential, if more people yeah. would do that, I think this place would be a lot better off than what we're dealing with right now. Uh, and the, the other part of it, too, that I want to draw your listeners' attention to, Kelly, is in addition to the partnership, is the part where Eli said, and I heard this voice, which we call yeah. our intuition. And right. that's not unique to Eli or to myself or maybe even to you, Kelly, but all of your listeners also have that same ability to yeah. tap into their intuition for what's needed in healing their own life. And I just want to send out the invitation to all of your listeners to practice and to get in the habit and build the muscle of connecting through intuition because it can be life-changing, truly, truly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in, in re reference to partnership, um, you know, I always hear people saying, well, it's got to be 50-50, and I disagree with that. I think mm -hmm. a true partnership is 100 and 100. Yeah. I think everybody brings their full person into it. We're not there to complete the other person. We're there to kind of enhance each other's lives. Right. And this whole, you know, I had never heard that vow. But I promise to support you to your highest potential. It means that sometimes Joseph wants to do things that I may not necessarily want right. to do. But if it's to his highest good and if it's serving him, then my job as his partner is to do what I can to support that. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's the yeah. loving thing to do. And be open and honest with each other. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's that's what I find in finance, you know, when I'm when I'm doing financial training in classes and things and and I don't know if you guys have noticed this is a lot of times you know either the husband the wife or husband husband one of them has trouble with finances and they don't want to talk with the other one about it it's like okay wait a minute if, if you want to if you want to get ahead you want to get through this you want to face this challenge you got to do it with your partner or your spouse or whoever it is that you're with because you're going to do, do a lot better and, and move forward quicker doing it together than trying to do it by yourself and hiding it from your partner. Yeah. And, and the truth is, you know, if you're really there to support each other to your highest potential, when your actions affect your partner's life, yeah. then you want to make sure that you're being responsible and handling your finances so that both yeah. of you can thrive and both of you can flourish together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, and money, I think it's been called the last great taboo that, <laughs> that we don't like to talk about. And I'm remembering top of mind, as you speak, Kelly, that we ran into this couple that were newly married. We, we met them outside of a restaurant in Coronado, California. And uh, we somehow quickly got on the subject of money and relationships mm -hmm. and how that might look and how that might feel. And the husband of this couple actually said, yeah, before my wife would marry me, we had to read the Dave Ramsey book right. together to get on the same page. And it can be any book on finance, right? right. I'm not especially a fan of Dave Ramsey. Um, but to have that, that common language about what's important, what do you value and what are your spending habits and what do you want to spend money on and why? It's, it's so beautiful when that can be 
communicate it. And I tell people the most successful thing I have ever accomplished in my life is being married for 22 years and have never argued about money once. Yeah. That's the most successful thing I've ever done. Because one of the top three causes of divorce is money problems. Mm -hmm. uh, and I and can, yeah. And I can say that too. Uh, you know, before my wife passed away, we were married for 20 years. We never had an argument about money. Mm. Mm, that's beautiful. That is. Yeah. And, um, I'm sorry about your wife. Oh, thank you. Truly. And, so and you it, guys, so you guys have had quite the journey. You know, yeah. you get you 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 form this partnership and relationship 22 years ago. You you end up getting married officially after all, but <laughs> but you start in California and you end up in Mexico. Mm -hmm. Well, so can, you know, we we built uh, an interior design business together, and it kind of kind of happened without really a lot of planning. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. You know, I do want to say uh, we, I don't know how, but our lives have just been magical in some way. And I believe that when you get really, really clear about what you're trying to create in your life mm -hmm. and then allow the thing to work itself out, you are just kind of guided and that happens. So Joseph and I were really uh, addicted to uh all the interior design <laughs> shows on TV, on HGTV. Uh, we could do that. We could do that. You know, we'd love to do that. And in a circuitous way, I was working in a show, in a, in a play, and the director needed help with the set. So I helped him with a set. And he said, wow, can you help me with my apartment? Mm -hmm. So overnight, mm -hmm. our interior design business was born. Joseph came up with the name Sublime Design. And then we got known as the Sublime Guys because of that business. And overnight, we had an interior design business. We did this guy's apartment for like 500 bucks or something. It was ridiculous. And then we did 32 projects that first year. And then our business just took off. And what year was that? This was like 2002. Okay. Like that. And it took off. And it took a lot of back and forth trying to figure out how to um work together right you know because we kept kind of overlapping and uh, there were some arguments about who's you know whose idea was going to be the winning idea <laughs> kind of thing so that was a little tough the first year but um we ironed it out and it was successful for quite a long time and then in 2008 the economy <laughs> tanked Yes, it did. And we were in the middle of like two or three remodeling projects, like kitchens and bathrooms and full houses and stuff. And all our clients canceled. And we thought, what are we going to do? And I remembered having traveled through Mexico on my own mm -hmm. many years earlier and come through this little town called San Miguel de Allende, which is in central Mexico. And I told Joseph, you know, there's this beautiful little town and it's an art colony. Why don't we go take some art classes or ceramics or something just to stay, you know, in the flow. Mm -hmm. So we came here for a month. We met people and we got three design jobs while we were here. We stayed for six months to finish them and we went back home and there was still no work. So we thought, well, let's give it a try. So we came here for a year and boom, everything just flourished. Mm. So yeah. after that, we went back home and sold everything. And that's how we came here. And that was 2008? 2009. 2009. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and what is top of mind for me right now, Eli, when you talk about this, is the words of Jim Quick, who <clears throat> I just love his work. He wrote the bestseller, Limitless, and has done a lot of other work in helping people with memory and mind. And one of the things he says is, we say this not to impress you, but to express to you what's possible. And what I'm hoping by this interview, Kelly, is that your listeners really get that there's another reality. If mm -hmm. for whatever reason they are unhappy or inundated with debt or overwhelmed with bills, that they can make a different choice. So what I'm hoping today doesn't happen is that it's like the Eli and Joseph, like, look at us, we did right. it. This is so great. But really to express what's possible 
if any of your listeners are unhappy or overwhelmed or or floating in debt, drowning in debt, not floating in debt. I knew there was some analogy yeah. there, some metaphor. Um, but the conversation we had before, we were talking about this, and we were talking about what you guys went through making that move. And, you know, you you did it, I'm sure, for multiple reasons. One was to try something new, but you had no work. You had to pay bills, right? So mm-hmm. you got to you got to figure something out. So instead of just the woe was me, mm. you guys you guys figured yeah. it out. And and then the other thing I remember talking about, and, and this really hit me, was we're talking about delayed gratification. Mm. So to get what where you wanted to go, and I think Joseph, you were talking about that last time that we had a conversation. Mm. Yeah, I, for so many of us, and I'm going to include myself in this, you know, we, we tell ourselves these stories about, you know, oh, I work so hard, so I deserve a two-week vacation, or my life is so stressful, I deserve to have, you know, a $400,000 house, right. or, you know, we, we want to reward ourselves because of our stress and because of our work, and I get that. And I just get really curious as a life coach, I get how sustainable is that, that we're rewarding ourselves, you know, with these monetary experiences or these monetary objects. And then what happens at the end of the year or at the end of, you know, tenures or, you know, where did that money go? And you look around at the objects, but you can't leave can't move out of the country or you can't leave your job because you've we've rewarded ourselves all along and i'm not here to shame or blame anyone because i think all of us have done this in some fashion (laughs) um and i just want to look at what's possible if we do delay our gratification and if we you know don't have to run out and get the new iphone or we don't have to run out and get the latest BMW or the latest version of the car. You know, can we be happy with less? That is not a hypothetical question. <laughs> I know the answer. You yeah. can be happier with less or at least well, as happy. You know, I, I want to <laughs> just share with you that, you know, before this happened and before we ended up in San Miguel, we were working very hard, like I think most Americans do, right? We mm-hmm. were in the rat race. We were working yep. hours and hours to pay for, we had, I had my house and he had his house and the cars and all that stuff. And, and I'm that, so busy. I'm so busy. Oh, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were busy, busy. Oh, I can't <laughs> because I'm working. Oh, I have a project. And, you know, there's a certain mm-hmm. amount of like status or ego when you talk about, oh, I work you know, 60 hours a week yeah. or whatever. Mm-hmm. But at one point, I very rem- distinctly remember telling Joseph, you know what? I feel like my soul is like shrinking into a raisin. It, it's like... There's got to be some other reality mm-hmm. than what we're doing because on the outside, everything looks great. But on the inside, I feel like dry. I just, I don't feel juiced up. Like, yeah. I don't know what we have to do. I, we had that conversation. Then the economy tank, which I don't think I caused that. <laughs> <laughs> but we found the cause, Joseph. Yes. We know who caused it. It was our <laughs> fault. <laughs> but then, then you know, so we said, okay, instead of sitting here being worried to death, thankfully we had some money in the bank. We said, let's go for one month to this little town. And then, boom, everything changed. And and I do want to say, in, re- in reference to what Joseph was um talking about when we decided to move here we sold or rather gave away and sold some garage sales everything we had two house full house yeah. fulls literally everything went going out the door in garage sales and stuff and we were left with whatever fit in my little toyota rav4 and that was it and at first it was terrifying Mm-hmm. And then it got really exhilarating to be free from all those things. So then we ended up uh, just driving to Mexico with whatever fit in our car. And we were renting a house and it, it didn't have all the things we wanted and all the things we liked, but that was okay. We were like yeah. 
exploring this whole new life, you know? And for, for us, that happened to be a solution for us. And the beautiful part of it was that we continued to make money in dollars, but we were spending pesos. So the money went further. Right. And it turned out to be a great little mm-hmm. accident, really. Yeah. And I well, know that that's not the solution for everybody, that they right. can't you know, pick up and move out of the country because of their family or obligations or work or right. something. However, what I do know to be true in my heart of hearts, Kelly, is that there is a solution for everyone Mm -hmm. if, to repeat what I said before, if they're unhappy or overwhelmed or drowning in debt, that there is a solution. And hiring a coach or a business coach or listening to a podcast or reading a book can be part of that solution. And I interrupted you. Go ahead. No, no, you're right. I was going to say thing i i got out of that that eli was talking about is simplify to multiply mm. um you know i've done that you know what four years ago i sold my family house that i you know my wife and i built and raised our family in. i sold that and everything in it mm. and started over and then i sold my business and i moved into a townhouse and then i got rid of that and moved into the house I'm in now and started over again. And it's, it's transformations. It's, you know, my life just keeps improving, but each time I do, it's like I flush stuff away and say, okay, time to start a new chapter. And I think people get scared of letting go the way that you Mm -hmm. have, because then there's all this spaciousness, right? There's right. all of this. Now, <laughs> like, what do I do? Right. And, you know, but my identity is tied up in that house or my identity is tied up in that car or that career. Or that career. Yes. Mm. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's a really interesting point. You know, now that we're living in, in an, another culture, it's, it gives you a different perspective. And when you, you can't help but kind of compare what it used to be and what it is now. Right. right. And in the States, there's a lot of identifying with our title, with our job, with mm-hmm. what we do, you know, like actually one of the first per- questions you ask people is what do you do when you right. meet somebody new? Right. Well, here, that's not the first question you ask people. Right. It's like, how's your family? Right. You know, do you have a family? Are you married? Do you have children? You know, how's your mom? You know, people talk about moms yeah. before you talk about and what do you do for a living? It's right. It's not like a status. <laughs> and there's a lot of uh, retired folks here, a lot of Americans. And what we've noticed is they may have been extremely successful and they move here and they retire. And now they don't have that identity. They're mm-hmm. not that executive or they're not whatever they used to be. And now they're just a person. Right. Mm. Now, who are you and what do you want to give to the world? So, you know, people start volunteering and start feeling useful in different ways. But I think there's a lot to be said about identifying with our roles. Right. Or with our positions in work versus really staying clear on who we are as people. That's where the value is. For sure. And, and we bring to yeah. the world. And if you figure that out, that's going to help you not only personally on moving forward, but financially as well. Mm-hmm. I mean, so many people label everything about money. Well, mm-hmm. let's get out of debt, not owe people money, and then we can do what we want in our life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. An amazing book that I was reading recently. <clears throat> that came out decades ago, Kelly, when you were just a tyke, but it's your <laughs> your money or your life. And, and she says in the book, among other brilliant quotes, is um, debt is the great dream killer. Mm-hmm. So when we are in debt, when we have debt, we talk ourselves out of doing things a lot, right? Oh, I can't go do that because right. I don't have the money or I can't start that new career. I can't write that book. I can't take that acting class, you know, because of debt. And, and I get why we get into debt and how easy it is, mm-hmm. especially where I'm from in America, how easy it is. And I'm just 
excited to invite your listeners, and I know that this is one of your passions too, is figuring out how to get out of debt and how to yeah. stay out of debt. Because you and I know a lot of people who have gotten <laughs> out of debt and then, oh my goodness, look, how did that happen? I'm in yeah. debt again, right? <laughs> Yeah. So. Well, it's very enticing, you know, uh, the perspective thing I was talking about, too. Uh, we notice when we go back to the States, there is a lot oh, wow. of pressure to buy stuff. There's a yeah. consumerism that happens everywhere. I mean, everywhere you see there's, uh, you know, signs on buses and billboards and you got to buy stuff. And somebody mm. has the greatest jeans and they have the best right. shoes and they have the best sunglasses. <laughs> <laughs> they just have newest car here. There's none of that going on. Mm, Our mm. car is 18 years old or 20. Right. Years old, like that. It's scratched. It's still really cute. I think it's cute. <laughs> I don't have to have. <laughs> I don't have to have the latest freaking car, right? Right. It works. It gets us to where we need to go. Uh, we a lot of people dress down. We don't have to have the latest trend in fashion. I mean, there's a lot of pressure with social media and the images that we are kind of thrown at us since we were kids about how we're supposed to look, what we're supposed to buy. Right. Mm. And there's so much yeah. freedom, truly. There is so much freedom in letting that go. Yeah. And there's a distinction between what you need and what you want. Yeah. You know, I was just in Mazatlan last month and spent a couple of weeks there. And I, I love going to Mazatlan because it, to me, you know, I've only been a few places in Mexico, but, but it's the most authentic place I've been. You don't see a lot of tourists there. Mm -hmm. um, but what you do see and what's really neat is when you go to like El Centro, all you see is families. And that's something you guys were talking about earlier was families. And if people would focus more on family instead of all the crap, it'd be a lot better place. Mm -hmm. When Eli was speaking, it reminded me of, we have a friend and I don't know how the conversation came up, but we started talking about reading magazines mm -hmm. and she said, Oh, I don't read magazines because they only create desire. Right. And when Eli was talking about billboards and signs on buses and things like that, it's like, it does create a lot of desire and, and that desire I'm wondering, this is what I'm curious about, is how can we fulfill that in a way that doesn't involve shopping or spending or going to the mall or something like that? And the answer is different for every person. Mm -hmm. I know what works for me, um, but I'd love to invite in for your listener, for them to find out how can they fulfill their desires that doesn't cost them money or, you know, make them work harder or invite in more stress. Yeah. I mean, people, people kid around, Oh, I need, to, I need some retail therapy, you know, people mm, right. about it. Right. I'm going to the yeah. mall because I've got a problem and I need to like figure myself out and buy myself <laughs> yeah. some shoes. Uh, you know, how many pairs of shoes can one person need? Um, it's not a judgment. It's just like, if you're feeling the need to solve an ache or a mm -hmm. wound or something by buying shoes, is there another way to access that, to heal that and to love yourself and take care of yourself by not incurring more debt and by maybe going to the beach instead or going for a walk or going in nature or playing with your puppies or with your children or whatever, something that's more fulfilling at a deeper level, that's mm -hmm. more healing than just going to you know put then just on a credit card spending money yeah putting it on a credit mm -hmm. card and spending money for sure yeah and it may not be as immediate you know the feeling that we get by going to the park or playing with the puppy may not be as heightened as putting something on the credit card or as you know that immediate gratification or delayed gratification but it certainly is more sustainable Right. Mm -hmm. And how will we feel afterwards if we spend a day at the park, you know, rolling down the hill or playing Frisbee or looking at the night sky, you know, versus going to the mall? I'll tell you what's immediate, though, when you get your credit card bill and it's oh. at zero, when it's <laughs> yeah. at zero. Yeah, that's immediate. That's immediate gratification <laughs> to know, mm -hmm. yay, I'm being I'm handling this. I'm doing what I need to do. do. 
and I had thousands and now, now I'm down to, you know, zero or close to right. zero. And then, okay, if I need to use the credit card during the month, I'm paying it off at the end of the month. I'm committed to that. Yeah. And um, that's that high for me is much higher than yeah. buying something. What that makes me think of Eli is taking care of our money as an act of self love. You know, how can we care for ourselves so that our credit card balance is zero because we care for ourselves enough? Because here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen, we know this already, but when the credit card bill comes in or any bill, I'm not blaming yeah. credit cards, and it's really high, how does that affect us emotionally and psychologically and spiritually? You know, um, that gets well, really scary and really stressful. Go ahead. Well, well and the stress it put, yeah, the stress it puts on you. and. It, anytime it puts stress on you then that also can create other things mm -hmm. illnesses and all that mm -hmm. yeah and and in part two we'll we'll dive into that more and, and talk about illnesses yeah. yeah i think for now i think kind of like the common denominator of what we're talking about is creating a different relationship with money yeah creating a relationship that's healthy that's productive that that gets us closer to our dreams <laughs> versus i mean i remember years and years ago when i was in college and even after college when i was first starting to work you know professionally getting bills and just being scared to death to open them mm -hmm. i didn't want to see what i owed <laughs> and how the hell was i going to figure out how to pay him you know Back then, you couldn't pay online. You had to write a check. And just writing the checks always like <clears throat> made my stomach turn. Eli, for those people, those younger people, a check, that's a thing you used to have to, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I remember write writing. Yeah, my big them. mark of freedom, Eli, was when I no longer needed to pay attention to the cents column, C-E-N-T-S column of the checkbook. I could just do the dollar column. Because there was a time when I had to do the cents column because my balance would get so low that I needed to know how many cents I had in my checking account yeah. as well. I mean, I figured, there you go. That's a check. <laughs> I figured, well, if I have checks, there must still be money, right? <laughs> yeah. and, and then, you know, when you get those bounce checks and you get the uh, insufficient funds charges. Mm. Oh, uh, we've both been there. We've both been there. We totally relate to what all of that feels like. So you guys have been there. So how did you get past that and get to the point where you're at now where you don't have to worry about the sense? So I'll speak to that. It sounds simple and I know that it wasn't easy, but for me, what I did, and I'm gonna invite the listeners to do this as well, is I made a decision that I didn't wanna live that way anymore. I didn't wanna live with that fear. I didn't want to live with that stress. I didn't want to live with all those mm -hmm. insufficient funds. Um, I made that decision and that kind of kicked me in the ass. And I got really super motivated to pay attention to my spending, to saying no a lot. You introduced that at the beginning of this episode, yeah. Kelly. I said no to a lot of things when friends wanted to go out to dinner or go to a movie or you know go on vacation. I would say no to things because I knew what was possible at the end of all that. You know, being debt free and having money in the bank and being able to say yes later on. I was willing to say no at the time. And I went carless. Uh, younger for the younger people, that means that I didn't have a car. <laughs> I went carless for about three years. I just um, rode my bicycle. I worked at a job that was just a couple blocks away from me on purpose so that I could get there on my bike. I shopped at the ninety-nine cent store for my food and for my toiletries and other things, and I got really committed. And also, this might help your listeners as well. I began to treat it like a game. Like, how quickly can I pay off my student loan debts? How much money can I still have in my jar at the end of the week after I've paid off all of my bills? How much money can I save today? I treated it like a game. And I had a big why. 
And my big why was I was living in an expensive city, San Diego, California. And if I didn't make it work, I was going to hightail it back to Wilmington, Delaware, to the cold, gloomy, slush filled winters <laughs> with my tail between <laughs> my legs. And I didn't want that ever. Um, so that's what I did. I got really good at saying no and delaying gratification and making it a game after I made that decision. Basically, be clear what you want. Just what Eli said. Yeah. And I, go ahead, Tim. And that brings you closer to your dreams. Mm, yeah. And I talk a lot about, you know, when I'm talking to people, whether it be in business or personal, is what's your dream? What do you want to accomplish in life? For my wife, for myself, it was my family. It was for my wife and I, it was seeing our kids, you know, go to private colleges, travel the world, be very successful. And they are, they're 28, 25 years old and they're very successful young ladies. That was our dream. So if you get clear, as you guys are saying, and then follow your dream, you'll get what you want, but you got to make sacrifices to do it. Yes, you do. Um, um, I kind of don't like the word sacrifice, though, you know? <laughs> I, no, Delayed gratification. <laughs> yeah, because I think what it is, is if you feel, if you if we approach it from, oh, I've got to make a sacrifice, there's right. this uh, kind of going on. Mm -hmm. I think what's underneath it, and when I was talking about shifting your relationship with money, is that you really have to work on loving yourself and really working on your self-worth yeah. in knowing that you deserve to have a beautiful life. You deserve to create an extraordinary life that's worth living. And when you begin to get that, you start making different choices. So then they don't really feel so much like a sacrifice. Right. It's a choice you're making mm. to create your dream. So it doesn't have that negative uh, right. punishing kind of energy of, oh, now you got to make sex. Like, it has more like, a ooh, I'm choosing this because mm -hmm. I love me. I want to have a great life and I want to have a great life for my family and my children. Mm. So, yeah. yeah. And what I want to invite in, in addition to that, Eli, is giving us permission to have these difficult conversations with our family and friends, because oftentimes the conversations are like you were saying earlier, Eli, you're like, oh, I need retail therapy or hey, let's right. spend Saturday at the mall or oh my God, look at these shoes that I've, I've you know, bought for myself. Mm -hmm. I get curious if, you know, can we have conversations about, oh, I listened to this podcast about getting out of debt. Right. Or I'm reading this book about managing my money or thanks for the invitation to be in your wedding. But I know that's going to set me back a little bit. And I'm going to say no to that because I have made this other decision about yeah. you know, my self-care. Yeah. And those conversations are much more difficult than, hey, let's go to the mall. Oh, yeah. Okay? But I just, I invite your listeners to begin having them if this is an issue that, well, that's showing up. Yeah. You make a really yeah. beautiful point, Joseph, because, and we've been talking about clarity. When you are clear about what your why is, your reason, mm -hmm. your dream, then, and this is what I invite the audience to do, whenever you are faced with a choice or a decision or an opportunity, choose in favor of that dream. Choose mm. in favor of that thing you connected to that you said yes, you know, that magnet or that carrot at the end of the stick that you say yes. And then you do learn to say no. And you can say no in a loving way and actually encourage other people to begin to notice that and say no, because they also are committed to their dream. Mm. So like yeah. Joseph said, I would yeah. love to come to Hawaii to your, to your wedding. Right. And I love you for inviting me. And right now I'm really wanting to get out of debt. And that's really important to me. Thank you so much. And um, I'm going to say no. You know, there's a beautiful way you can say no right. still not reject the other person and maybe they'll go oh maybe i should start thinking about <laughs> yeah. getting out of yeah. debt we can encourage other people by right. just staying true to who mm. we are yeah absolutely yeah 
Awesome. Good stuff. Good stuff. So, so what are some podcasts or books that you, either one of you would recommend for people to watch or listen to or read? Hmm. There are so, <laughs> so many. Um, it, I have a podcast. Okay. Uh, it's called, Are You Waiting for Permission? It is a guest-based podcast. We just recorded our 90th episode. Um, and it is interviewing people sometimes about money, but mm-hmm. oftentimes about living their dream and pursuing their dreams and giving themselves permission to do that. Um, one of my favorite books, because I read on this subject a lot, um, is by David Bach. Mm-hmm. Is that true, Eli, or is it Harvecker? I confuse the two Which of them. Which one? Um, Secrets of the Millionaire Mind. That's Harvecker. That's Harvecker. Yeah. I really like that book because he's delving pretty deeply into the stories that we're telling ourselves about our money and how can we stop screwing it up. So I would start with those two things. Are you waiting for okay. permission podcasts and secrets of the millionaire mind? I think I have, the, I think I have that book back there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How about you, Eli? Um, Joseph, the book that we just finished doing at our book club, your Money or Your Life or your the, Kyle, the Kyle Cease book? Well, that's another one too. Your Money or Your Life is a wonderful book because, and I have to tell you right now, if you're planning on doing it, it gives you very st- specific action steps on exactly what we've been talking about. You've got to know how much is coming in, how much is mm-hmm. going out. So the book really guides you very gently and powerfully into mm-hmm. keeping track of your money so that you can make different decisions. And then yeah. you can say, yeah, you know, I'm going to pass on that, on those two lattes I do every day. I'm going to put that over here so I can pay off that. So it's very specific. It's a little bit like in your face confrontation. Right. Mm-hmm. But at the same yeah. time, it's, you know what? You got to do it. You got to yeah. know how much money's coming in and how much money's yeah. going out. That's yeah. when you you can take control take control of it. Mm, the other awesome. book that I really really loved is by Kyle Cease, and it's called the, the, illusion, illusion of- the illusion of money, because it really has nothing. To, well, you think that he's going to get into the whole money topic, mm-hmm. but he doesn't. He gets into the topic of what we've been talking about about loving yourself and yeah. taking care of yourself and that's what's underneath how we respond right. to money. i'll i'll have rebecca put these in the in the title so here, of, here's a question for you yeah. kelly so when eli was just speaking he talked about the book being gentle in this and then he also talked about the book being a little bit in your face and mm-hmm. i'm wondering when you are coaching somebody who is struggling with their own financial stories, their own financial reality, what approach works best for you and your clients being gentle or being in your face? You need to know, you got to get to know your client, Mm. get to know your client, Uh, build, you got to build a relationship for me. I have to build a relationship with that client because I want to know that client. I want to know their family. I want to know their situation. More importantly than anything, I want to know their why. Why do they want to become debt-free? Why do they want to do this? Why are they finally reaching out? Because if I can discover their why, then I can touch on their why when we're going over things and reiterate it. Because people don't argue with their own information. (laughs) I love that. Mm-hmm. sometimes and, i don't think people even know what their own information and, is. and you're right eli they don't yeah and that's why you got to draw it out of them right and if i can draw that out of them then i can reiterate back and if we've talked about something and and you know hey try this try this read this do this and then if we have another meeting and they don't that's when you got to get stern with them mm-hmm. You know, I, the reason I was down in Mazatlan, I was uh, went down for a really good friend's wedding and they had a beautiful wedding on the beach. And then they went to this beautiful restaurant in, in downtown Mazatlan and had the reception. And and it was really informal, but a lot of, you know, there was like 100 people that went down to it. Well, I went up to his son and I said, hey, are you going to give a toast for your dad and, and his wife? He's like, no. And I'm like, yeah, I think you are. <laughs> and I said, I went to her son. I said, you're going to give a toast for your mom. Well, no. And I said, yeah, I think you are. 
<laughs> so I said, I'll tell you what. I said, I'll give the first toast and then you two can do a toast after that if you're more comfortable. They're like, okay. Well, what are you going to do? Well, a year earlier, we were down in Mazatlan. I was down there with him and he had just started dating this gal. And he says, hey, Kelly, he says, if you ever see me start to mess it up with her, he says, she's, you know, great lady. And I had met her wonderful, wonderful lady. He goes, if you ever see me start to mess it up, he says, take a two by four and just hit me right upside the head. <laughs> so his toast, the toast was, I made a two by four, <laughs> carved a handle in it and put Scott's reminder on it. And I gave it to him as a wedding toast and gift and said, if you ever mess it up here, Laurel, you can use this to hit Scott upside the head. It's the same thing in coaching finances and, and coaching. I'm sure with you guys and, and even your life coaching is sometimes you got to take that two by four and just smack people upside the head and get their attention. Mm -hmm. But if, again, if I can get to know their why, then I can reiterate that back to them. Yeah. So they don't argue with their own information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think getting really clear on your why is yeah. like essential. And later on, when we talk about you know the challenges of getting right. through cancer, couldn't have done it without being, right. being very clear on that. Well, and, and that's the thing is, as we close on this session, I want people to really understand that if you pay attention to your why, if you get out of debt, if you become debt free and you are living that life, then you can deal with what we're going to talk about in our next session. Yes. And before we close this session, I just want to say if anybody's needing a bit of support or uh, some uplifting and ideas, uh, we have something coming up at the beginning of January. Joseph, you want to share about that? Sure. It is a six week on Saturday, super simple, just an hour and a half with Eli and myself. It's called the joy of money, transforming your relationship from worried to worthy. And the reason that we came up with this course is because in all the work that we do with our clients, the number one thing that people worry about is their money. And that's what's keeping us awake at night. That's what's keeping us tossing and turning. It is screwing up our relationships with our spouse or with other family members or friends. And when we can get that to a place of more peace, 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 yeah, and less toxicity, that's priceless. Yeah. So you can find us at sublimeguys.com slash money sublimeguys.com slash money thank you guys thanks so much for listening never by the book be sure to tune in next week when we unpack part two of the interview with the sublime guys until then be sure to share this episode with someone you care about and don't forget to subscribe through your favorite podcast app so you'll never miss an episode as we close today remember if you're not doing it by the book it might just mean you're on to something great <laughs> Until next time, be great. <laughs>